afternoon and happy new year to everyone. We are so extremely excited to have all of you here this afternoon. This is a kind of our inaugural uh, webinar for 2022. And we wanna welcome you to Pivoting for Success using community-based participatory research um, during the twin pandemics. Uh, this is an amazing opportunity for us to partner with our uh, good partners and colleagues at the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center in, in Detroit. Uh, so welcome, I'm Al Richmond, Executive Director of Community Campus Partnerships for Health. And I wanna welcome you on behalf of uh, Community Campus Partnerships for Health and say a little bit about our organization, who we are and the work that we're doing. This afternoon's a session, uh, which is a virtual roundtable of community and academic community-based participatory research practitioners will discuss how um, during this era of COVID-19, these organizations and partnerships have pivoted um, to address the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racial injustice to continue advancing the work. We will explore how panelists have handled the challenges and found opportunities to, opportunities to widely and rapidly develop new partnerships and sustain long standing ones using a CBR approach. I wanna share a word about Community Campus Partnerships for Health and uh, a little about our mission if you're, if you're not familiar with us. Community Campus Partnerships for Health is celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, 2022. Our mission is to promote health equity and social justice through partnerships between communities and academic institutions. We view health broadly, and certainly during as we respond to COVID-19, we all recognize that the social determinants of health and other factors are critically important to address health. So as an organization, we view health broadly. We emphasize partnership approaches. We believe in the fundamental need for healthier communities, and we are committed to social justice and strive to model equity and justice. I'd like to introduce Dr. Barbara Israel, Executive Director of the Detroit URC, and ask that she give greetings to you and tell you a little bit about the Detroit URC. Barbara? Thanks so much, Al. And welcome, everyone. Delighted to have you join us. Um, already seeing familiar names um, and uh, new names. So I really uh, appreciate your being part of this. It's uh, a real pleasure to be co-sponsoring this event with Community Campus Partnerships for Health. Um, as Al said, um, I am the director of the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center, Detroit URC for short. Uh, we are a community-based participatory research partnership in the city of Detroit for over 25 years, uh, fostering and supporting CBPR partnerships aimed at better understanding and addressing health inequities in the city. Um, and one of the programs that we do that is part of the co-sponsorship of this event um, is our CBPR Partnership Academy, uh, which is a national pro training program for community and academic entities to come together for a year long uh, capacity building mentorship um, event and activities and opportunities and social networking. Um, and thank you to my colleague, Chris Coombe, who just put a link in the chat. So I encourage you to look at our website if you want more information on the Partnership Academy. Um, but this is, uh, we are funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And this co-sponsoring of these national webinars is a part of that CBPR Partnership Academy. And if you'd like more information, please reach out to either Chris or myself um, and certainly take a look at our website. But I'm really eager to hear from our panelists. So I'm gonna cut it short and turn it back to Al. Yes, thank you, Barbara, and um, glad to have you and your colleagues here from the Detroit URC. A little more about Community Campus Partnerships for Health. Um, again, acknowledging this, this is our 25th anniversary. You'll be hearing more about our celebration of our anniversary and um, connecting with all of our partners across the U.S. and the world actually to celebrate this moment in time. Well, we really give attention to the work of Community Campus Partnerships for Health for over 25 years. That's absolutely exciting. And it's, uh, it's a great way to kick off the year with this webinar. 
So CCPH accomplishes its mission um, through a variety, if we could just go back there, uh, of promoting health equity and social justice, again, by facilitating partnerships between communities and academic institutions. Many of you are familiar with our the principles of partnership, where we center authentic partnerships. Uh, the four anchoring pillars of that are our guiding principles of partnership, which are 12 statements around partnerships, quality processes, meaningful outcomes, and transformative experiences. We do our work through uh, five pillars uh, around leading, convening, disseminating, partnering, and training. And today you will see all five of these actually uh, being demonstrated uh, during our session. We're providing leadership in the field of, of community-based participatory research. We're convening virtually. We're disseminating best practices. We are partnering with our colleagues at the Detroit URC, and we're providing some training for you all in, in refreshing all of us in the area of community-based participa participatory research. Next slide. So again, I'm Al Richmond, Executive Director of Community Campus Partnerships for Health, and I want to introduce our panelist for today. Um, our first panelist, and actually I'm calling these, uh, they will appear in different order, but our first uh, introduction is that of, um, of E. Yvonne Lewis. Um, and Ms. Lewis is the founding director of the National Center for African American Health Consciousness. Um, she is uh, a thought leader, a trainer, facilitator, and mentor. During her 34-year career as a community health advocate and consultant, she was executive director of three nonprofit organizations and has led several community-based efforts at the state and national level, which have had significant impact for engagement on communities with communities of color. At the local level, she helped organize the Faith-Based Health Team Network, was a founding member and first chair of the Community-Based Public Health Organization Partners, or CBOP, and first community chair for the Michigan Prevention Research Center. Uh, we're glad uh, to have uh, Yvonne with us. She's a longtime friend, and it's taken a while for her to connect into CCPH through our webinar series, but we're certainly glad to have her um, with us today. Next speaker. Next slide. Our second speaker is um, Ilima Hoy Batimosa, uh, and she is... Uh, Joining us from Hawaii today, she is a strong proponent of food sovereignty and sustainability. She is passionate about giving communities the tools, knowledge, and skills they need to grow food in their own backyards. Her favorite method of sustainability is using aquaponics technology to emphasize the genius of ancient Hawaiians. And for that, we're glad to have her. We also want to recognize that as a founder of God's Country, um, she offers programs to um, um, uh, residents of Hawaii and Native Hawaiian communities. She is the recipient of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Community Campus Partnerships for Health uh, 2020 Health Equity Award. She's also uh, was recognized by uh, the Hawaiian Civic Club and other groups and organizations. Welcome to our call today. And finally, Tiffany Alexander, who is a co-founder of Pediatrics PM and CEO of the Tiffany Alexander Group. She's a native of Alexander City, Alabama, and former Benjamin Russell NJROTC cadet. Tiffany Alexander is the co-founder of Pediatrics PM and After Hours Pediatric Clinic servicing the Birmingham metropolitan area and CEO of the Tiffany Alexander Group, where she creates and inspires through event planning. We welcome all of our speakers today, and we're going to ask Tiffany to take it away. Hi, guys. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm so excited about this. Al and I have had a great time working together over the last few years um, on the Stride Grant. So, um, Al, are you asking questions, or are we just going uh, through the script? If you have slides, you can share your slides. Do you have slides? Oh, give me one second. I thought that I had question number three. <laughs> I did not know I was panelist one, but it's fun. We can change the order. 
we can actually have Yvonne to go and then we can come back to you, Tiffany. Perfect. I'll give you a minute. Okay. Yvonne, can we um, ask that you uh, start your presentation? Sure, Al. Yes, you can. Good afternoon. And thank you so much, Al, for your introduction and for the opportunity to be here. And as you mentioned, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, and uh, I actually worked with Dr. Israel for, I actually got my teeth cut working with Dr. Israel in, in uh, here in Michigan. And I want to just take a few moments to talk a little bit about the, the National Center is an organization I organized a few years ago. We're looking at addressing the needs of African Americans and our health consciousness, just being fully aware of all the things that were going on. And so as a consulting um, firm, I began to expand the work that I've done over the years in, in community academic partnerships. And so in these, in these 30 years, we've learned so much. And when you talk, Al, about the twin epidemics uh, or pandemics, it took me a moment to kind of get my hands wrapped around that because there's so much going on. But to signify the fact that COVID was here, but also racial and equity, racial injustices and equity has always been an issue for us, which is one of the reasons why it was so important to elevate the consciousness of the African American community. Because when we looked at the disparities, there was always this difference in health outcomes of African Americans. And as we began to work in the community academic partnerships, first looking at the overall health issue, we looked at diabetes, cancer, heart disease in the African-American community through our churches. And our partnerships with the universities in that community academic partnership became so important because they helped us to identify the data that was necessary to really put some concrete the numbers to the issues that we were facing. And so if we fast forward to 2016, 2014, water crisis here in Flint. And I'm sure when I say Flint, Michigan, just about everybody will raise their hand and say, yes, I've heard of Flint and heard about the water crisis. Well, one of the things that we realized as we've partnered over the years with our academic partners that when this whole issue of the Flint water crisis became a national story, we would get a lot of researchers wanting to come into our community and do research on Flint. Not anything new because we were already a research mecca, but this just added another element. And so community partners and academic partners who worked together over the years formed what we now call the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. This was a partnership between community partners, the University of Michigan Flint campus, the University of Michigan Ann Arbor campus, and Michigan State University that now has a campus here in Flint. Those, those, those groups came together and the Healthy Flint Research Center, our goal was to really try to reduce the what we call helicopter research and really ensure that whatever research was done in our community would be a, a significant benefit to the residents of the Flint community. This has been and continues to be a powerful work, but it is, and I wanna emphasize it is work because when we think about community academic partnerships, they require a consistent ongoing engagement of academic partners as well as community partners who make a commitment to work together to make a difference. So there was no exception to this. The concept would be that we would have representatives from each of these groups and we would then form what I call this next iteration of CBPR. Al, when I say that there's equitable voice, equal and equitable voices. Took, took some work to get to that. And we're still continuing to work on that. But this framework now provides the community to be elevated at a level partnership with our academic partners. We had been planning activities together. And one of the things we were planning in March of 20, before March of 2020 was the third annual research symposium. This is where we brought our academic and community partners together to understand the work that was specifically being done here in Flint, Michigan, and showcase that work with, with some of the students that, as well who have been working on research. Well, as most of you know now, in March, in the state of Michigan, our governor said pretty much cease and desist because of the expanding uh, COVID uh, uh, virus and the impact of that in our community. We were experiencing a significant number of deaths, particularly in the African-American community. And so schools shut down, stores shut down, uh, businesses, MTA had to, our mass transit authority had to rearrange how they were doing uh, mass transit. And so here we were, this executive team planning a symposium and we had to stop 
and say, we can't do that because we had more than the number of registrants that were allowed. But we also ask ourselves, what do we do now? And how do, how do we become relevant and maintain relevancy in the midst of this crisis? And so it was a Monday afternoon, we were doing that planning. We pivoted, talking about pivoting. We shifted from talking about a research symposium. And by that Friday, the partners had worked together long hours, evening hours, early morning hours, and stood up our first community webinar on coronavirus. It was March 20th. I'll never forget that day because now here we are 97 weeks later and we're still facilitating the webinar every Friday afternoon at 12. Now, why did we do that? Because we needed and we wanted to put a local context to a global pandemic. We're listening to the national news and they're talking about what's happening all over the world. But when we're in our local community, have the majority of our students in the schools on free and reduced lunch, and now they can't go to school. Where do they get their food? When we're wondering for people who need to use mass transit, how do they get from point A to point B and they can't use the mass transit? When we're hearing that our hospitals are overloaded and we're asked, don't go to the hospital unless it's in the dire emergency because we don't have enough room. We don't have enough hospital beds. What do we do? And so what our goal was is how do we talk to our community members and help them understand how do we access resources and services in a way that makes sense for our local community? Where do we go to get those resources? So we quick, quickly pivoted. And as a result of that, and I don't have enough time to tell you all the intricate details, but it is an amazing, amazing experience that now well over, we invited our community partners, the schools, come to the table, join the webinar, Tell us what's going on in the school. We invited our hospital partners. Tell us how we navigate the hospital system, the MTA. Even our governor over the course of this time had a representative who would come and share insights from the state, but also what happens in our community. Our mayor's office had a representative to come to talk about the things from the city of Flint perspective. Over 96 weeks, now 97, actually this Friday, tomorrow at 12 noon, we'll be on this webinar. How do we respond to community issues? We had questions. Where do we go for resources? How do we understand this virus? In my lifetime, I've never experienced a pandemic. I don't know what it really feels like to see so many people of my friends and loved ones who are dying of a disease that is a virus that is unknown. How do we get our hands around that? Our mental health department, our mental health services came to the table to talk to us about how we handle in this crisis, mental health issues, not only for adults, but for seniors and for children, especially when we're saying physically or socially distanced, when we're a community, that particularly when there's a loss of a loved one that we gather together and support each other, and that's no longer possible. This webinar provided us the opportunity to answer those questions and to help us all understand how we dealt with it. And yet we still had to talk about some of the inequities that we were facing because in our state, in our county, the number of African-Americans that were dying compared to the number of Americans were dying in, from a percentage perspective, was well out of line, it was very disparate. And so we wanted to figure out how to address that. Our state set up a, 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 a task force, particularly to look at those disparities and those injustices. So pivoting me and answering questions, what is the virus? How does it spread? How do I protect myself? Where, and it, it continued to evolve because then testing became available. Where do I go to get testing? Vaccinations became available. Where do I go to get vaccinated? And how do we understand the value or the, the let me say it this way, the, the, the perceived or real risk of vaccinations? That's a huge conversation right now. How do we properly message all of this to ensure that our communities understand and, and then now we're talking about treatment. So we thought actually that we would be about four weeks doing a webinar and maybe we would be in some place where people would have an understanding. And I will say to you again, it's 97 weeks later and we're looking at week 100, where do we go from there? Just as an example of the things that have happened that respond to community needs and pivot, one of our community health workers came and said, I'm watching this webinar every week. We cannot now gather to get our continuing education credits. Is this a way? 
Can we use this mechanism? So we reached out to our Michigan Community Health Worker Association and our team got together. Now we're able to provide community, ed community education credits for community health workers. Then our social workers came to us and said, can we get social work credits? We can't do what we need to do to get our social work credits. So we work with Michigan State University School of Social Work and now we're able to provide social work credits for people participating in the webinar. And on an average, every week, we have 20 social workers and community health workers on the webinar. Why is this so significant? Because they're the boots on the ground too. They are actually talking to our community members who may not have access to uh, the internet to do the webinar, who may not be in a position where, because they're working to get this information. So we're working together to provide the information for our community. In addition to that, we started off with just a webinar. People come on a webinar, we try to answer questions, engage them, and it expanded. So now we're Facebook Live. We ask people to join us on Facebook. We ask them to like us. We have a Healthy Flint YouTube channel. So like us on Help Facebook, join our YouTube channel. These are all things that we learned in the process because we wanted to be able to respond to community needs. We're only able to do that because we have strong community academic partnerships that didn't start today. But this is years of conversation, years of working together that has now proven to be successful in helping us make a difference for our community. So I figure that I'm pretty much out of time, Al, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Just let me say too, we've had over 7,000 over 7,000 participants across YouTube, Facebook, and our weekly webinar itself. And so this is a great opportunity for us to look at the resources and services that we have, the partnerships that we build, over 30 agencies who continue every week to be panelists and answer questions as people put them in the Q&A for us. So I'm excited to have had this opportunity to share just a little bit of what we're doing. There's more. But I hope this has been helpful to someone. And Al, certainly appreciate this great opportunity. Yvonne, so powerful in just detailing how you and the work that you're doing there in Flint has actually served to be so responsive to what we call these twin pandemics, right? And what I really appreciated about your comments was just this local response to a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful, right? And the platforms that you use of social media and other strategies of engagement to reach over 7,000 residents yeah. is just phenomenal. So thank you for really um, uh, sharing what I think is really a best practice. I mean, you need to develop some manuscripts and other products that really highlight how you're using the principles of CBPR partnership engagement to really make a difference in your community. What amazing and great work. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to have you back in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to call on Elima uh, to actually share with us uh, her work around illustrating the translation of CBPR to health equity through some uh, examples of the work that she's doing um, in Hawaii. Take it away there. Mahalo. Um, I really didn't want to follow Yvonne because the work that she's doing is amazing. So mahalo for your work in, in your own community. Um, I wanted to say aloha to uh, Chris and Barbara at the CBPR Academy and mahalo to all of you for letting us be present, um, representing uh, Kanaka from Hawaii. What I really like to talk about is what we started originally after we graduated, myself and Dr. Jane Chang Do, um, the CBPR Academy, we started Wamanala Pono Research Hui. And during the pandemic, we really had to pivot and learn a lot, same like Yvonne and many communities. So we've been going on with um, the Pono Research Hui since February of 2017. And actually next month we'll be doing five years. And our community loves to gather as Hawaiians, as people, we gather, we share food. And that was always our goal. And it's been really, really difficult. And we thought we were gonna go back in person last summer and it went for a month and then we back, back online hybrid. So hybrid has been a lifesaver actually. So our community participants come, they pick up their supplies and dinner, and then we gather online. And we've been able to do that with our uh, aquaponics program as well. And then our Uluponamahi Aina gardening program that we started last year. And what we've learned mainly from the pandemic is that 
a lot of people in Hawaii have taken it for granted that our food is always going to be available, not only food, but supplies. So when the pandemic hit, um, at the very beginning, a lot of services and supplies stopped. So we had always advocated for growing your own food, doing backyard gardening, you know, doing things independently because Hawaii prior to colonization and uh, the visit of Captain Cook in 1778, uh, almost a million people lived in Hawaii, totally independent, free and growing all of our own food. Through all of this change in Americanization, we have noticed um, about 90% of all of our food as well as all of our products come from away from our shores. And it's not a good method of function. It is uh, in monetization, but when you actually have a pandemic, it's bit, and we, we've known this uh, all along, it's just, it took this pandemic to realize the rest of the community that it's not a good system. And so we have had so much input from Hawaiian communities throughout the state of Hawaii. And um, we have been fortunate with Zoom as our platform. We've gone to Maui many times, multiple times, the big island of Hawaii to teach. And then we also come back to our own community of Waimanalo, which is on the south side of Oahu, southeast side, to do these types of webinars, to do learning. And so we can go back after they've learned all of the academics, after an initial learning in person, and it's safe, uh, it's been working. Uh, we come from a very Hawaiian and very cultural mindset and framework that um, really works for our people of Hawaii as Hawaiians, because many of the programs that are funded by national health, NIH, what have you, um, is very Western. And so lack of participation as far as the people that really need the support is one of the um, issues that happens in Hawaii. And so, and in many places, you know, because we all have our own way of learning, our own culture. And so it's been really helpful for us to be able to come from our lens and our worldview and really share and really get adapted into other Hawaiian communities. Uh, we've been asked by uh, lots of First Nations peoples, Maori, um, Pacific peoples in general to kind of help them to move forward in this kind of thought because um, when they see our programs in action, they can definitely relate to the way that we teach. We're very hands-on, uh, very uh, alohe alo, which means face-to-face. -face. We really like to be together as people to share. With a pandemic, it's very, very difficult, but once you make a relationship that clicks in person, it really helps to bring people to the table on a webinar because I, for one, don't like it, but um, we have to adjust. We have to pivot. We have to make things better and still run our programming because our people need help. Um, I think Yvonne had mentioned about mental health and I see the struggle even for myself personally, but I see the struggle within a lot of our communities because of the lack of gathering and building up of community, our social uh, justice issues, our family. And so that's the things that we try to share. We try to keep it short because we don't want our people to be overwhelmed. Um, I like to highlight that we have lots of partners, uh, First Nation Development Institute, um, Hawaii Electric, uh, Hawaii People's Fund, Hawaii Community Foundation, Kamehameha Schools, all of them realize the necessity of having food in community. Uh, we've had a lot of success with community partners. And we just wanna say thank you to all of them for believing in the way that we think and what is important to us as people and supporting our, our drive to keep our people fed. And to all of the farmers and participants and families, Ohana, that have stepped up to actually put food forests and aquaponic systems in their yards in order to feed our community. So mahalo for the opportunity to be here and I look forward to moving uh, along and sharing more in the panel. Lama, that's so powerful. Food justice, food sovereignty, the, the concepts of indigenous learning and how this pandemic has actually served to bring attention and highlight the inequities around food was, that was already there. 
but your comments just awakening me up to think about like that this current model is simply not sustainable, right? We're going into our grocery stores, we're seeing empty shelves. So what do we do? What's How do we respond to that? So thank you for sharing. I think that we're so impressed with the work, but I hope we will be inspired, you know, just to think about that those closing comments around food first. If we don't have food, we've been, we've been talking about this for years, but your comments really, and this pandemic really brings it home. So thank you so much. We're just stay, stay around. We're going to actually invite you back uh, for a time of Q&A. I want to acknowledge all the amazing chats that's going on and are you sharing um, your comments in the, in the chat box? So thank you, keep it up. We're glad to have all of you here. And I know that we're gonna have an amazing conversation. Tiffany, you're coming to us from Alabama today and a very different perspective. We've had uh, Hawaii, we've had Flint, Michigan. Now we're going into the deep South and we invite you to share your experience about how your work is actually kind of pivoting uh, to move forward as we address uh, racism in the U.S., but also um, COVID-19. Tiffany, we're glad to have you. Hi, thank you, Al. I'm trying to start my video and it says that I can't because the host has stopped it. Okay, we'll, I'll, I will actually see if I can. Um, you, you only have to use it if you want to. It's, it's oh, totally- Oh yeah, there we go. We're good. Perfect. Okay. Hi yeah. guys, Tiffany here from Alabama. Um, it, I mean, it, COVID for us has just been a whirlwind. I mean, it's been an experience. Um, so I will talk from the university perspective. Al and I actually met on a program in Stride. It's called Strengthening Translational Research and Diverse Enrollment. And one of the major questions we got was about trust. So, I mean, we know after many, many years of racial disparities, health disparities, socioeconomic uh, status, social determinants of health, all those terms that have been thrown out. Um, we just saw that all of those converged during COVID-19 and were more apparent than ever before. Just everything from access to the vaccine, to access to testing, to what do families do in the world of virtual, um, to education. I would say one of our biggest um, issues was education. I worked with the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I also did some consulting with the boys, the local boys and girls club here. Um, also having an after hours urgent care for kids, just being able to see what our kids were talking about, you know, how school affected them from mental health. One of the major issues we also saw was kids coming into the clinic saying, I have a stomach ache when really they don't have a stomach ache. It's really just mental health issues, not being able to acclimate from the lack of resources. We were expecting our kids to learn in environments that they had never learned before, which was a huge issue in mental health. So what we did through Stride was we tried to develop some tools in the informed consent process. Everything that um, we did in Stride went directly into COVID research out of the um, University of Vanderbilt, which was a, Vanderbilt was a huge proponent for the vaccine, uh, was on the forefront of getting the vaccine released, but we kept seeing issues around trust. And so I think that community-based partnerships um, for research are one of the only ways that we're gonna be able to build trust and actually increase our access to healthcare um, just from the, you know, making our, you know, making our communities feel safe around getting the vaccine. Um, you know, we've talked heavily about the Tuskegee experiment, which was done here in Alabama, and it's just really hard for our citizens to get past that. It's like, you know, we're not that far removed from an experiment in which African Americans were just test dummies, which is very sad to talk about. You know, I don't know how many of you on this um, call are familiar with the study or actually, you know, have had conversations with individuals but through the Stride Project and simulation, we actually talked to individuals that were around during that time. And, you know, they had gone on to get formal education, but at the same time just had issues around trusting our health system um, and actually, you know, developing access. 
So we you know, talked about the many elements of community engaged approaches across all the study phases, everything from um, educating our communities about research to involving them in the consent process. So one of the major things that we did was just redlining the e-consent process, making it easy to understand. And we found that that was huge. Um, being able to talk to patients, being able to talk to communities and say, hey, this is exactly what's going to happen during the process. We'll guide you through it. I did it. So can you. We as a community have to band together in order to um, survive this pandemic. We still have very low vaccine um, numbers as far as getting our you know, community members vaccinated, but we do feel like that we're making, making headway. Um, we're still at very low numbers, but are very optimistic that, you know, together through, you know, campus-based partnerships, we will be able to educate um, patients and communities on the vaccine around health and also access to health. One of the other things was talking about storytelling. Um, storytelling was huge. So basically being able to say, this was my experience um, in participating in a research study. This was my guide. This was my um, research assistant. And I felt like it was safe. We feel like, you know, that that's one of the only ways that we're actually going to be able to influence research is to get community participation on the research level, um, talking with our PIs and saying, hey, this is what we're hearing in the community. Maybe let's try this. You know, we've had a lot of bench science. We've had a lot of research done and we've made great strides. But the only way that we can continue to make strides is if we do have community based approaches. Um, in the world of COVID, we had to do a lot of videoing. I mean, I know everybody got super tired of videoing, but it was effective, you know, being able to record um, our research participants, obviously with their consent um, in order to spread awareness. We used avatars, um, you know, for people that looked like us, you know, because we, you know, we've seen that if we don't have people that look like us that are actually involved in the research, then it's harder for us to trust. Um, we also looked at consent language, you know, not talking about, you know, blood and saliva, just like, you know, it's research methods, but actually talking to people on a human level. Um, we also talked about, you know, different techniques in portrayals of the simulation case, you know, talking about exactly what all of those steps would look like. And then, um, you know, not just doing paper copies of things, you know, because that was very unsafe, but also implementing e-consent processes. So that was sort of our experience just from a university and from a um, clinical perspective as to what we saw was during the twin demics was um, access to care, building trust, and then um, addressing mental health um, in our youth like none other. So I'm happy to answer any questions once we go to the panel, but thank you guys so much for having me and, and allowing me to share sort of my unique perspective um, from a community perspective, but also from an academic and a clinical perspective. Thank you, Tiffany. Your comments actually kind of contextualize this where you sit in Alabama, right? And yes, so yes, I mean, it's just- Proximity to Tuskegee itself, right? Less than I mean, we're we're less than two hours. Right, right, and so, so I mean, and I know I know that's something some of you guys may not have heard about in a long time, but it's still very much a real conversation to the point that when we, I mean, when we first started talking about the vaccine, it was on everybody's radio, it was on everybody's news, and basically having to talk about here are faces that look like you that are a part of the research process. I can do it, so can you, was just, I mean, it's a simple method, but the avatars and the storytelling and the building of trust was, I mean, instrumental in um, just telling that story and, you know, giving access to care and access to the testing, but also, um, you know, looking at things from an aging population, you know, which is the people that were very much a part of the Tuskegee experiment, but those individuals being raised, uh, raising their grandkids. So we've got kids in schools that are hearing those stories. So in order to um, break that cycle, we're having to basically insert ourselves into that middle of that conversation and say, whoa, 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 guys, let's, you know, educate our students, let's educate um, our citizens. So just looking at that age gap, um, you know, talking about social determinants of health and, you know, racial equity and racial disparities, we have a lot of 
of our grandparents that are raising kids and you know that that you know just bit of education is just something that's very much real here in Alabama. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, it's what you, again, your comments are saying that this work is not void of, um, you know, an understanding um, of the history. And who knows that history better than people living in Alabama, again, less than 100 miles away, um, just a couple of hours away from Tuskegee, kind of the epicenter of what many of us talk about and think about when we think about health inequities and injustice on a large scale and an institutional systemic level. So thank you for sharing with us about the work that you're doing um, in partnership with the University of Alabama, Birmingham to pivot and to connect what you call the pandemic, twin demics, I think is the term that you use. So uh, we'll move that one forward as well. So we wanna thank all of our panelists and wanna invite them back. Um, encourage you to put in the chat box any questions that you may have for our panelists, but I'll go ahead and get them started as you kind of formulate your questions. Thank you for your comments and, and thank you again to all of our panelists for their, um, their uh, just passion for the work uh, around uh, community-based participatory research and making a difference in their community. But I wanna start this out and I'll, I'll start with maybe uh, Yvonne, um, since you were one of our, our first speaker today is to, to just kind of elaborate a little bit more around what models of CBPR and community academic partnerships uh, do you think really serve to advance equity? Um, you know, just based on your experience, I'll just leave it like that. What are some of the models um, we, we, we oftentimes tell people to use these models, but just from a practical um, standpoint, how do we use these models of engagement, CBPR, to advance equity? What works? Maybe what doesn't work? Yeah, so, so one of the things, Al, we often talk about is really having credible voices at the table, really having community at the table. We talk about community-based participatory research. You can't have community-based participatory research without community being at the base of that research. I mean, so just in and of itself, just the concept of community engagement. And then having the idea that it must be community engaged at every level. You know, sometimes it's, well, let's just get folks at the table and, and ask them a question, and, and then we're all good. I'm at a community advisory board, and as long as they're all there and you give them a cup of coffee and a, and a, and a ham sandwich, we are good. But really hearing the voices of community, letting those voices rise up. So at some point, that community begins to help develop that community research agenda. And so that, that issue of listening, I think one of the real principles that we, we went through a, a process at one point of identifying, so what does it mean? And we talked about being respectful. You know, what are those principles that we wanna use? Being respectful. So that means you need to listen. So we really had to learn how to listen on both sides of that equation. Community needed to be able to listen and understand academia. And then it's really important that the academic partners would listen to the voices of community and put it in context. It may not always be, we, we take sometimes the same words, but they have a very different meaning because of the context of which that word is being used. So we can go a long way with just talking about the whole, the, the whole theme of communication and understanding what we're talking about getting away from the acronyms. And I think Tiffany, you said it, speaking in terms that people can really understand what, what's being said. So I will stop there, Al, because we could, we could talk about all these different principles and, 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 and models a long time, but until we get those basic things, can I hear you? Can I listen to you? And can I communicate to you in a way that you can understand it? And then we build the next step. Elima, Elima I know that this is, you live this work every day, right? What works, what doesn't work when it comes to engagement and even concepts around community-based participatory approaches? Well, um, I wanna say that the program that we started with Amanala Pona Research Hui um, actually has become the advocate and also the permission. We, call, we have a program called the Shark Tank and researchers need to come in, present their work and maybe we're gonna support it. And if we're not, then it's done. And I think that's the biggest part of community-based participatory research is to flip the script. And you know what? I also teach them to flip the table because if we're not invited to the table, flip the table over, really. Because <laughs> you come to my table, 
I don't have to come to yours. And, and you know, we really want to empower our communities to understand that they need us more than we need them, honestly. So mahalo. That's, that's really what I got to say. So at this moment, though, I'm going to pick it up and, and I want you to say more there. It's like at this moment, has this moment made a difference? Like in the past two years, do you feel or sense a, um, a, a greater uh, desire on the part of people in your community, the Native Hawaiian community, to take control? We talk some about food sovereignty and food justice, but what are you seeing in this moment? there i really see a lot of um engagement from the community that was always silent uh, we really never had a voice and we did have a renaissance in the 70s but i because i believe because um now we have maybe 30 years going now we have hawaiian immersion programs they learn from a hawaiian context they don't learn english to the fifth grade it's a totally different mindset the kids think differently they don't know who the presidents of the united states are and it's not important to them they learn what is important to us as a people how we were wronged how we can fix it and then they advocate and so it's a mind shift from all of us that were in tradition traditional school that had to learn the abcs and one two threes of america and our children and our grandchildren don't know it. And so it's learning for the whole family and then understanding the power of our people and our place, because this is our land and land back, because we want everything, not only our land, we want our people, we want our culture, we want our country back in Hawaiian hands. And so this time has really given all of us the chance to come together, and to meet like this in a webinar all over the state, it's simple and one thought, one mind, because just like there are many tribes, we have many islands, many communities, lots of conflict, but coming together through this practice in a webinar series makes it easier for everybody to communicate. Um, we all have a voice and we all trying to work together to better our community and our people first, because a lot of times, not only us in Hawaii, but Pacific Islanders in general are at the bottom of the barrel on everything. So, so now you dropped another concept and that is education sovereignty. So you talked about food sovereignty, community sovereignty, and now you dropped this new piece on us around education sovereignty that, that many communities are, are, are thinking about. I mean, I've been thinking about that. Like, what do we do if our kids cannot go to school, what do we what do we do? Do we just say they're just going to be behind, or do we say we're going to organize? And this work, your your comments just make me think about the whole uh, freedom school movement of where um, historically black colleges and universities in the southeast were started because um, they were forbidden. We were forbidden to go to other schools, right, by law. You know the practice. So how do we in this moment? Think about um, self-reliance and using these principles of community organizing in that space where and we're not just kind of saying, oh my God, our kids are going to continue to fail, but actually stepping up and doing something like feeding our own communities, educating our own communities, all of that. So these are wonderful concepts that you're putting forth that makes, I think, many of us begin to think about what can we do. Hey, Tiffany, what are you all thinking about this in Alabama? Like you, you've heard so, these comments. What, what, yeah, what, that was one of the things I was gonna say is just on a university level, finding a cross sector between healthcare and education, you know, through Stride, there were several conversations about um, collaboration and trust and capacity and readiness, um, not being able to really address healthcare until we address education. You know, we had very well educated individuals talking about uh, participating in research, but it just still wasn't quite enough. So talking about education sovereignty, but we also have to look at it very much from um, a K-12 perspective. You know, we were talking about earlier, you know, how the pandemic affected education for us, which also then in turn affected healthcare. Um, we, we had to um, provide healthcare professionals in our nonprofits that were providing education to students was one thing that we found. It was every site um, that was providing an alternative based education to have a school nurse. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I mean, we couldn't have kids coming in there without that, you know, t temperature checks, that sort of thing. And because I mean, the kids being at home, they just kept falling further and further behind. But then also, 
um, eating terrible. So now, I mean, you have a dying brain and you have a dying body. So the only way that it really worked for us um, here was having our healthcare sector and our education sector literally collaborating. Um, but again, it was a lot about collaboration and trust and mistrust because it was, well, why isn't this my project or why don't I get to have the top voice? But eventually we had to say, hey, 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 everybody gets a voice here, but we have a mission and we have a job. Um, so we need everyone's expertise, but we don't need your emotions. <laughs> but it was, it was very much, um, it was, I mean, it was a dog fight. I, I can tell you that like nothing about it was pretty. Um, some school systems, um, you know, in the inner city didn't go back to school, whereas some of our school systems in the um, suburbs did go back to school. So it was really not a one unified voice. So mm -hmm. we have kids within a 15 or 20 mile radius that are getting different educations, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. means they're going to have different health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tiffany, thank you for connecting that together. I want to take a point of personal privilege to just ask you all a personal question, not too personal, but as a community health leader, I wonder, what are you all doing to, for yourselves as you face these twindemics? What are you doing, Yvonne? What's the, hey, we can't hear you? Just unmute your phone. You didn't expect that question, right, Yvonne? No, yeah. but it, it, it's, it's, no, but it's a good one because exactly. I was thinking about, as you talked about the principles and we think about shared decision-making, shared values, and we talk about sharing resources and that whole piece about the, you know, the, the equity piece. It, it, it really challenges us to think about how we look at that from, from our own personal perspective. And I, and I really had to get in touch with what does all of this mean to me and why am I doing this? Because in these kinds of environments, it was, it was challenging before, but in this environment, you can say it's hard, you know, it, it really is hard. And, and, and am I committed enough? Do I believe in it enough that I can stay with it? And then what do I do to take care of me? So one of the things is I listened to our community members, the core of the work that we do, and they talked about mental health and getting the partners to come on and talk about mental health. I had to pay attention. So we asked our mental health practitioner, who was one of our partners, let's do a mental health moment right in the webinar. And so she took a moment to breathe. And so what she's telling, telling I mean, she's telling them to breathe. I'm like, I need to breathe too. You know, and every now and then we think when well, we offer to our community members to get some support and counseling, you know, we need to do that, too, because you're carrying the burden of the things that are going on in the community. You're working hard with partners and partners are working with you and we don't always agree. Well, how do you, do, you know, give up some of that? I almost said regurgitate, but, you know, how do you really give up some of that and then really ask yourself, what is it that I need to hold on to? And was it that I need to let go? It's a personal process that helps us then be more sensitive to what we're hearing from our community members. And not only am I asking these questions for them, this is the reality. I'm not just asking how do I protect, how do we protect from COVID for them? I'm asking how do we protect from COVID for me? How do I help somebody else know if they make a decision not to mask up, not to get vaccinated, that that decision is going to affect me as well. So it's really that give and take on both sides. I'm doing it for me because I care enough about me to care enough about those who I'm working to serve. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing we have to also center is the fact that these are not normal times. And Nilima, you brought that home. Like, you know, I remember, you know, I it just these are not normal times. So what are you doing? I'm not going to. I'll talk about me in a minute, but what are you doing? Share. Well, mahalo, Yvonne, for bringing up the, um, you know, the choice to vaccinate. So uh, we have a lot of push and pull because of um, historical traumas mm -hmm. with um, Americanization. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that yesterday I actually got my booster shot. Oh, two days ago. Sorry, this is the second day, and um, it was my decision because um, actually. I want to say how I, how I um, do self-care. So I want to say also that I'm a social worker. And when I went to school for social work, which is not too long ago, I never had a college degree until uh, maybe a decade ago, maybe less. Um, I never knew the concept of self-care. 
because as a woman in a Hawaiian community, you take of everybody first, you last. And if you got enough energy and time to take care of yourself, great. So I won all of the awards as far as um, self-care, learning from social work. And so one of the things that I do monthly is I go to a Korean spa. And um, it's for my mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional health. Carrying burdens of community is very difficult. And so I not only make the time, I take the time because my phone is on 24 hours a day. And if it's ringing at three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to pick it up. And that's hard. And a lot of people think it's crazy, but you got to do what you got to do when you can do it. And then when you need to take the time for yourself, you do that as well. I also want to say that on January 1st, I left Hawaii for 11 days. And my husband and my husband was in Italy for Christmas. And he met me in Las Vegas. We went on a lot of trips and we went on a boat cruise. And everybody, including the CDC, said not to do it. And I did it. And did I get COVID? No. And I came home and I did my booster shot because that for me is self-care. I really got to be away in order to disconnect. Otherwise, and people know, and they gave me the space, but I also was working and I was on vacation and we're writing a grant that's due soon tomorrow, uh, Saturday, you know, you still got to work, but there's a limit. And so in order to make the limit is you set the barriers and the boundaries and, and you got to be okay with it. So thank you for the question. Yeah, this makes me think about an article I was reading earlier about the challenge of being um, a uh, leader of color uh, in, in, in the nonprofit arena. And one of the comments that they made is that uh, you take on oftentimes more than others do because you live in the community, you are of the community. At one point, you know, I, I, people were calling me and I'm thinking, I'm not a physician. I can't tell you what to do. But I was their only point of contact lifeline, so to speak. They felt like I was going to provide them with accurate information. And so when I hear you say that, Inima, I just think about, yeah, like people are calling, they're texting, they're texting me, they're asking me, where can I get a kit? Where can I do this? Many of us spent what, uh, Tuesday or Monday or this week, whenever, uh, reminding people to order kits like this, 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 uh, um, the, the announcement that there would be a national rollout. So many of us spent time hours texting people. I was texting people in California and going through my phone, trying to reach out to everybody that I knew so that they could get one of the kits. I mean, that's the work that you do as a community leader is you're just, it's like 24 hours a day. So I just appreciate you saying about how to how to disconnect, if you will, uh, from this, because it's, it's really hard work. The work of community-based participatory engagement for academics who are committed to it or for community leaders is, it's a lot. And so that's why I asked the question, Tiffany, what are you doing? So Alima, I kind of to, to make the point of what she was just saying, talking about grant deadlines, I think the one thing is, you know, it was hard enough in academia pre-COVID, but now we're in the virtual world of COVID where like it never shuts off. We thought that it didn't shut off before. We yeah. thought that it was one thing to go to the university and be putting in grants on Sunday. Now it's like, oh no, I've got a chokehold on you. You're always available. And I think just being the one thing for me was setting boundaries you know, being a community leader, but also being in academia, but also being in clinic, it just, I mean, it gets to be overwhelming. So what, I mean, the one thing that I did was banded together with people and did a business forum um, and just talked about it and said, hey, you know, as business leaders, as community leaders um, in the healthcare arena, like, let's talk about it. And we did a panel that just kind of told people, hey, it's okay. Like, it's okay to not have it all together. It's okay to cry in the shower. It's okay to say no. You know, I mean, I had to tell them like, Shonda Rhimes cursed us. I mean, I don't know if anybody else read, read or listened to the year of yes, but I mean, I think every woman of color was like, I can do it. I can take on the weight of the world. And when COVID hit, it was like, we're gonna do it. Like, if nobody else is gonna do it, we've got to take care of our family. We gotta take care of our coworkers. We gotta take care of the kids. We gotta take care of this person and that person. And I think it just got to be too much for everyone, um, especially, you know, in the African-American and Latino communities, mental health isn't really anything that we talked about. You know, um, talking through Stride, we really were looking at 
um, research in the African-American and Latino communities. And one of the outcomes that we ended up finding out just going into the end of that grant um, in COVID is mental health. You know, it's not a conversation that we want to have. It's not something that, you know, that people are familiar with or comfortable with talking about, but it's a very real thing. And I think that that's one thing that we can appreciate about COVID is it did make it um, a safe space to talk about mental health. And that was one of the things that I did was, you know, made it okay to talk about, you know, make it okay to talk about with your friends and say, hey, it's not okay. Like, I'm not okay. I'm taking on too much. I need a break because I can't, I can't say two years ago or three years ago that anybody on this call would be comfortable having that conversation. You know, your researchers, your physicians, your community leaders, you get up in the morning, you put on your cape, you put on your face and you're like, I got it all together, sister girl. It's fine. But I mean, COVID definitely made it okay. To, I mean, it made it okay to say I'm not okay. And I think that that's one of the things that we can appreciate. Wow, thank you so much. I want to um, pivot just a, a little bit here. Um, I see Susie has a question um, uh, for uh, you around um, um, Ilima around um, the Shark Tank. Say more about the Shark Tank and describe that. Now that's one of my favorite TV shows. Uh, <laughs> and so I think that's appropriate in Hawaii, right? You have some sharks around in those waters there. But tell us and describe Shark Tank and and uh, how that's going. Well, and absolutely wonderful for the community, actually. We have a lot of researchers that come from America, the continent, who have a great idea and they want to come to Hawaii and we're going to save you because we got a lot of saviors out there and we don't need saviors because we can save ourselves. Um, and the Shark Tank is a great example. We actually have um, some publications, which I can't figure out where they're at at this moment, but we actually had a... a public health student uh, write up an article and come up with the criteria. And there's a whole outline of everything that needs to be done and given to the community prior to you coming to our community to talk about what your plan is. And so they have time to do the research and background check of what you're doing. And then you come and make a presentation at our meeting, whether now it's on Zoom, but uh, I gotta say that in person is awesome because they literally get, bitten up, chewed and spit out easily. And you can't really have that same reaction on Zoom, but uh, it really works. And um, a lot of times researchers believe that they got the power and they are the know all and do all and am all. And when they come to our community and they figure out that they're not walking through with the helicopter science because it's not gonna happen in our community, it's beautiful. And um, it was something that came up because the community wanted it. They wanted to know terminology. And again, we've been at this next month, be five years. And so a lot of times when academics come into the program or into our realm, they have all of these big words and our community didn't really understand the wording and what they were saying. And so now our community is very educated on those terms and acronyms. And sometimes, you know, um, those people in their ivory tower think they know everything and maybe we can slide one past this community and it just doesn't happen anymore. And so proud of my community and their efforts to want to know and learn and then really put other people in their place because a lot of times that's what they come to do to people of color. They want to put us in our place that we are at the bottom of the pole and you need to stay there. So mahalo, mahalo for the question. Thank you. Um, Tiffany, we have some questions. I forgot to look in the, in the Q&A box. I was like, where are, the, where, where are the questions? And I was like, oh, there they are. Okay, so uh, we have a couple for you, uh, Tiffany. Um, so one person asked, would you be willing to share the consent language that you, that you all used? Um, and a related question for you, Tiffany, is what, lang what challenges, if any, did you have with your IRB around making HIPAA consent language accessible. We've had particular challenges with this and on our studies. Um, it was definitely a beast. I mean, Al can tell you that we, I mean, the grant just kept getting pushed back and back and back just as far as our timelines because um, part 11 compliance was an issue for us because working with multiple institutions, but also getting through the IRB was just a tricky um, task. But I would say just work with whomever is at your university because um, they're gonna be able to tell you based on your exact 
um, studies what the best way to put that in. Um, ours was a little bit different just because of Part 11 compliance because we were working with multiple institutions, um, but we also were using REDCap which made it a little bit easier for them to be okay, say yes, okay, because I mean, it was already approved. Thank and you. And then we will glad, I will gladly share the, um, the um, Stride Toolkit with you that talks about our e-consent process. Thank you, we'll make sure. And that then we'll also have some, um, some um, information on the avatars and the storytelling that was really helpful um, in, recruiting. Yeah. Um, Yvonne, I have a question for you. Uh, because of your longstanding uh, association with academic institutions, um, can you speak to the sustainability of the measured outcomes of interventions developed with CBPR compared to non-CBPR approaches? Um, this individual is saying, I'm trying to build support for CDPR within my institution, and I'm receiving that specific question regularly. Can, can you speak to that? Yeah, Al, that's, a, that's an excellent question because it's an ongoing question. <laughs> One of the yeah. things we talk about, it, 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 it does require a lot, and it requires some sustainability uh, from the perspective of what I, what I call institutionalizing the concept. And, and I'm, I'm sure all of us have learned over time that because community engagement is so difficult. It, it takes longer. And so we're, we're taking every little piece of the process. And when we're saying, even for the, the webinar, as an example, as a way to, you know, you've got to figure out what those metrics are. How do you measure the number of people? Because uh, I was told the other day, uh, and over time you hear this, that the, the currency in academia is, is research and dollars. You know, how many dollars do you bring in? How many, and publications, let me say, publications. If there are no publications, then people don't feel like you're doing work. If there no, if there's no research, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's netting the kind of value that you wanted to have. So we're talking to our, our partners about how, from a community perspective, how do you help us figure out how to quantify and qualify the work that's being done? And it really takes a strong commitment by academic partners to help keep this forward in the minds of the institution, because if they don't see value in it, it's easy to get discouraged if you can't get on a tenure track because you're trying to work with community. Mm -hmm. Yvonne, I would say the one thing that we that we had to do is publish, publish, publish. I mean, it was the I mean, it was our only saving grace because otherwise it was like, well, why are we hiring these community investigators? Wait, why are we paying them? Wait, so and so at this institution is getting paid this for community. Well, why are we getting paid you know paid this? But it's all based on what your institution sees as value. Yes. And so the one thing that we did in order to get um, the support was, hey, we're going to work together, but at the end of this, we're going to publish a peer-reviewed white paper. And after that, everybody's eyes just light up. It's like, you mean to tell me that we have been sitting here for three days talking about that we have citizens and we have residents and we have patients that are scared to come in and participate in your research studies. But it means it takes me talking about the white paper for you to get excited. Exactly. I mean, it, it was truly insulting. It's like, you, you don't understand the cries that we hear in community about, you know, my child is sick and they don't have access to this, but I'm scared to put them in a research study. I mean, you have dying patients that are scared to participate in a research study. And we don't want to address the cultural um, issues there. But when we start saying we're going to talk about a white paper, people get excited. It, I mean, it's, it's sad and it's sickening, but it was the only thing that worked for us. Um, so that's one of the things, and thank you, Tiffany, for that. But that, that's one of the things that excites, excites me and excited me so much about the concept of the Healthy Flint Research Coordinating Center. When you have two academic institutions that have historically in the state of Michigan been rivals, Michigan State University and the University of Michigan Flint, who act, and the University of Michigan and Arbor, who actually decided it was valuable enough for them to commit dollars to support the community's portion of being engaged in this process in order to ensure that. And so, yeah, we have to continue to work at this, but I would say to the individual to ask a question, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Take a, take a picture out of our playbook and say, you know, use what Tiffany just said. We'll figure out how to write a right paper or do as we're saying, help us as we're walking through these community engaged activities. 
from the academic perspective, tell us where it might be the possibility for a paper. Because that's not the way as a community member, I'm not looking at, I'm, not, I'm looking at how many people dying over here. How come we can't communicate effectively the, the, the concerns that our community has? But as an academic partner, that's why the partnerships are so incredibly important. As the academic partner, you know what that currency in the institution is. So bring that forward and help us figure out as we're navigating the engagement processes, as we're talking about shared values, and as we're talking about shared resources to get to equity, then help us as community identify those places that it can be a white paper. And then the flip side, when the community tells you about a need for a project, then figure out how to help get resources to fund that community engaged project so that resources are being brought into the institution. So it's a long story. Give us a call. I'm sure any of us will be happy, but call us and let's talk about what we're actually doing in a little bit more detail so we can really help each other because if we help each other in these discussions, what we learn will certainly be of value to the other institutions that are looking at um, partnering together. I'd like to um, yes, please, talk please. about that. Um, so like I said, our Waimanala Pono Research Hui is made up of a lot of community members. And you're talking about publications. We have 20 authors, 15 authors, on a, because our community members are authors on all of those peer, peer reviewed, reviewed journals and that's by choice because why should the academic get the by, byline? And also the community members, they're the one that start the process and they get the first authorship. And, and that's by design. It's, it has exact, everything to do with the Shark Tank and it was by design. And basically I can tell you that I never knew any of this uh, maybe about a decade or so ago. And I'm a quick learner on a lot of things. I'm getting older now, but I'm a quick learner. And once I understand the process, are we taking back everything? And, and you know, that's that's what we got to do as brown people. You know, people of color, we got to do that. We got to take everything. So now you've introduced yet another concept and that is research sovereignty. So there's food sovereignty, education sovereignty, community sovereignty and research sovereignty. So this comes full circle. I mean, this is so amazing. Um, I We are so close to time and you all have just provided such amazing um, response. Um, when, I wanna just ask you a quick question. So, um, and I've been asking so many people this and I want each of you to respond to this. Is this a moment or is this a movement? Yvonne, a moment or a movement? Say more. I think it's a I think it's a combination because I think what COVID has done, it has elevated some conversations that we need to take advantage of in the moment and utilize this moment to move forward. An agenda we've been trying to move forward a long time. We've always said, I, I'm, I live in this community. I understand my community. My lived experience brings something to the table that should be valued. So in this moment, it's an opportunity to build on a long-standing foundation of a movement. Tiffany, moment or a movement? I'm gonna say it's the trajectory that we needed, the foundation to just jump off and keep on flying. Um, Cause we're not trying to jump off and dive down. We, we're, going, we're going up and there's no stopping us. Great question. Hey, Tiffany, moment or a movement, say more. Uh, I definitely say movement. I mean, I don't think we'll ever go back. I mean, I think that it, I think that we've definitely developed partnerships through all of this that um, have proven to be very useful. And I definitely say movement. Well, I want to thank all of you as as panelists. This has been an amazing afternoon of just conversation. Uh, and that's what we wanted was some conversation this afternoon. I want to check the Q&A box to make sure I got mm, some of the questions. Um, um, I want to just check, just, got, uh, you know, I think we should do this one. Um, we talked some about white papers and other manuscript development. Um, any any thoughts around how to challenge the 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 work and the production, the research production and scholarship around that? How do we balance that? 
Ask that one more time, Al. You know, the person was saying that, how do you develop manuscripts and other products when you're the one that's doing it all? Like you're on the front line and you're, you're writing. And I know what that feels like because I'm so busy doing the work. I don't have time to write about the work, right? Mm -hmm. So what are suggestions do you have around how to balance that? Um, for us, it was just developing partners. I mean, you know, it was me, you, Marva, like it wasn't one person that could do it all, but it definitely took time. I mean, it took time to say, hey, we're going to commit to this thing and we just got to make time and it can't fall on one person. Um, also getting the support of your institution. We had great backing um, from the rheumatology department, basically people who it's their full-time job to do that. It was, hey, we've got this issue. We need your help. And it definitely took some bugging. Um, because they're like, oh, we've got to work on part 11 compliance. We got to work on IRB. And it's like, but you've brought us to the table to consult with you on these, um, you know, community-based research approaches and you want our input, but you want us to publish, then we, we have to hold you to accountable just as much as you hold us accountable. Um, there weren't easy conversations. It was definitely like a stick in the mud sometimes, but in the end we got it done and um, the university was happy. I think that it was a useful tool for the community. I think we learned a lot. Um, we made a lot of partnerships. Um, so all in all, it was great, but sometimes it was definitely like being a stick in the mud. Al, I'd have to agree with Tiffany about the need to kind of keep pushing. But I also think there's an opportunity in this window and moment in time as we push forward is to talk to our funders, those who are funding the research is have conversations with them about the value and how we might make some adjustments so that there isn't, there isn't such a rigidness, if you will, that the academic institutions only can follow this path, but give a little bit more opportunity. And I do see some of that happening in some of the recent research that's being funded. And then I also think that as we develop our community skill sets, there are other ways we can start. And I, I'm, it's amazing to me the different kinds of of uh, publishing opportunities that are coming out. I know peer reviewed is like the, at the top of the line, but there are other mechanisms. And so this is where, again, I think the community academic partnerships are so incredible that we work together and understand how to speak that collective voice to the powers that be. So it's not just an academic going saying, we need to do this, but it's that partnership that's saying, we need to make this space for opportunities to promote this movement so that more people can have benefit of the lessons that we're learning in multiple ways. Well, I couldn't think of a better way to start 2022 than with this trifecta. I mean, you all are just amazing. So thank you so much for joining us today. What a great conversation that was just so passionate and so reinvigorating for all of us to do this work. Uh, uh, you know, conversations around sovereignty, conversations around justice and equity and how we use these principles and these concepts to advance just that. I'm going to encourage you to stay connected to Community Campus Partnerships for Health. Visit our website at ccphealth.org. Also, find out more about the Detroit Urban Research Center. So, uh, Janelle, I think you're putting up a slide there to give us some contact information. Thank you. So, find out more about the Detroit uh, Community Academic Urban Research Center by visiting them at detroiturc.org. They have amazing projects and opportunities available to keep this conversation moving. And to find out more about CCPH, visit us at ccphealth.org. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our partners. Um, reach, out, reach out to us through email by emailing us at info at ccphealth.org. Thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.